There we go. Um, I first want to start by saying, uh, I'm sorry if I cough during this because I've been sick for a while. Um, but here we go. Um, hi, I'm Tiffany. Um, my typeface is called Umbrella. <laughs> I don't like naming things. And the project started as a dream. Like, I literally had a dream one night back in February where not only did I dream about Rihanna um, as she was about to perform at the Super Bowl, but I dreamt about designing a typeface that is the love child of Rihanna and her baby daddy, ASAP Rocky. And so, since I, <laughs> when I got to type Paris, it was very clear we had to follow through with the dream. Um, but how do you design a type to represent a person? It's, you know, we have to think about this. I decided to limit the scope of the project to Rihanna specifically to keep it simpler. And simpler means describe her as a woman who is all of these things and so much more. So I looked at music for research, I looked at interviews, I looked at like her autographs, books, and things that she's done. Um, and I think that what was most useful was not the music work because her graphic design is not that great. Um, and I looked at her product design instead. You see here, there's just a lot of sensors, there's a lot of clean lines, it's very geometric. And um, then I looked at her fashion because you must look at all the fantastic outfits. And I saw a lot of patterns of how she liked the dress. She often loved a big jacket and this sort of like angular diagonals. Uh, sort of silhouette, and she also loved accentuating curves. So these are visual cues that I can take from Rihanna to try to make a typeface. And the other approach I suggested was to think about what she represented. What are keywords that encapsulate why Rihanna is Rihanna and different than any other pop star or person? And I thought about how she took risks, she's confident, she has this very contemporary aesthetic, and she is so singularly Rihanna, but also adapts in so many different ways. She can just really fit in any situation. So I wanted the typeface to do all of that and more. What does this actually look like? We can talk about what we want to do. And I decided to start by experimenting by having angles everywhere, because that's edgy. Um, we, these were not particularly great experiments. Then, okay, we're going to take the literal jacket shape of sort of having um, shoulders that are wide and then kind of tapers in. Here's a bunch of ends where I explored different shapes. And that didn't really work either. So we just have to go off the rails and just try to make a bunch of different ends that don't even look like serif typefaces anymore. Um, I was getting a little worried, but ultimately the instructors thankfully helped me dial it back. And we found a place where I could take some of the iconic parts of her aesthetic, such as the snatched waist, and um, these sort of angles that aren't, they're not pointy angles. They're like not cute angles, she loves an obtuse angle like this. <laughs> and so I tried to bring all of that in to make an actual text typeface. Uh, while doing this, I ran into an issue where a lot of the rules didn't work for my typeface. Um, we can see here we have a standard Garmon up top, and then we have my typeface, which is kind of a flared serif. The flared serif has a weird distribution of wave where it's almost reverse contrast, but it's not yet weird enough. It's a little bit in a no man's land. So I struggled to work through how to balance out the characters and make sure it's weird, but it's not too weird and make them so read it in text. Uh, here are a bunch of notes and iterations. I did work. And here is the final typeface. Uh, we can see, oh, there's a bar interrupting it, but uh, ultimately the snatch waves produce a flare serif. I didn't set out to make a flare serif, but here we are. And um, another main point of the typeface is that the joints are really narrow and deep, and I also have a bit of risk. 
And then we have this corner tension that happens in a bunch of the curved shapes where there's it's curved on the outside, but then you have the piecing on the inside. So there is sort of both actions going at the same time. And lastly, we have a diamond tittle and period and comma because we want to shine right in the diamond. <laughs> Here are the caps, and they outline the rules pretty similarly. Uh, the only difference is that because the capital letters are often more vertical and horizontal, so it's more straight lines, it's harder to make them snatch. And the diagonals, K was start on those, those are hard to make, so hard to make snatch. And so I essentially learned with the caps everything needed to tone down a bit. We also needed to balance out the weight better because the flared series would be so dark. Um, and ultimately, I think everything worked out. Here's the whole uh, set of letters, and then we have diacritics. I featured these here only because I was very scared of them before I needed to type errors. And now I need a bunch of them. <laughs> I, I still don't really know how to read them. This is the American problem. And then we have our figures, old style, and tabular ones, a bunch of punctuations. Here's just a feel of the text. Um, you know what I mean? It's, kind of, it's, it's definitely casual. It's not a traditional texter, but the rhythm is nice and gentle, even though there are points in between. How do we ex extend the system? And so I played with a bunch of weights and widths. I think that they add a lot of a lot of spice to the situation. This is like different variations of Rihanna. I like to think. You know, there's quiet Rihanna. There's like I'm dressed up for the gala Rihanna. Um, there's just bold because you need bold. That's a practical game. And then black, and then I'm working on a pitch black, which is even darker than this. It's like I'm graphical, I'm here, I'm taking up space, Rihanna. Then, okay, we did all the important stuff, but like baseline. How do we make it saucier? How do we make it spicy? Or try to. Um, I told John Marcella at one point that I was doing sketches that I wanted to make a waist more snatched. And he looked at it and just said, that was just a gross contrast. Not that special. But hey, this is not a traditional reverse contrast. We can see it's just more quirky, it's more silly, it's more display. I haven't gotten to the opportunity to work through the whole system, but like where it's going. And this is a proper reverse contrast. So they're not the same thing for the record. Um, I had this also another avenue I explored. I really struggled with trying to make my system work and learn to be more aggressive. I even texted the whole WhatsApp group to try to serve me what people wanted and decided that I went what I wanted to say. So here's my talents in progress. No one believes in this route. None of the instructors or my class get voted for it. But, you know, we're feeling it. I think it's, it's a work in progress. And there's high contrast. I try to make spans, I try to put more angles in, getting more edgy. And then we also tried some crazy uneven strokes. Um, but, you know, ultimately those feel like weaker directions. And lastly, what did we learn out of all of this? We made a specimen, um, and there's a completable typeface in basically like three to four weeks. Um, and we also learned how to pay attention to the system across all the shapes. I think it was very easy to make a snatch shapes happen when I was working on just a bunch of vertical sounds. And the more I went through it, I was like, oh, this is so hard. Why did I make these decisions? Why did I make black or light uh, weights? I'm like, why did I make this? Why did I make all the decisions I made a week ago? But um, ultimately, it all adds up. It all looks fine. <laughs> And lastly, I just want to wrap this up and say thank you to everybody for just a really good time. We learned a lot about ourselves, and um, I really enjoyed everyone, um, you know, having snacks with us. This is shapes and a bunch of mixes. Uh, we made our own calligraphy tools. Um, and just thank you for riding with me. I know I cried a lot, but. You know, and I only cry on Thursdays exclusively. Today is a Thursday, so let's see how this goes. So thank you for your time.
I love this.
Hello. Hello, Wes Nelson. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kyle, and I designed Aquanaut. It's a typeface inspired by Wes Anderson's film, The Life of Life, with Steve Zissou. And I was inspired by uh, Moonrise Kingdom. It's another movie that Wes Anderson did. And uh, back in, I think, 2012, he commissioned Jessica Ish to do a custom typeface for the movie. And back when he did The Life of Aquatic, he was using Futura for everything. And I was like, what would happen if maybe we went back in time to custom typeface for this period? Because this is one of my favorite movies. So I was inspired. I didn't really know where to go with this typeface. I wanted it to be wacky, but also kind of handcrafted, and it needed to also work as a font for smaller text because it was for um, movie credits. It would be in the opening title sequence, and I didn't really know where to go. So I was looking at a lot of typefaces from the time period that inspired the film, from like the 60s, the 70s, and then it wasn't until I really saw this street sign and I was like, oh, it looks so wacky. It wouldn't really work for my typeface, but it would be a really good jumping off point. So I did this, and then uh, uh, we started exploring with different letter forms and different uh, experimentations of what the typeface could do. I drew a lot of humanistic uh, letters, a lot of uh, more um, contemporary letter forms as well, and then uh, it was when we did this experiment where we went with bold, we went with reverse contrast, that I was like, okay, I think I know the direction that I want this typeface to go. So here it is mocked up as the title, The Light Aquatic with Steve Zissou. And here it is as movie credits. This is the regular weight, and that's the most legible. It's going to be the smallest that it would be seen. And here's the character set for just a through Z, lower and uppercase, diacritical marks. Here it is in smaller text. There's just a little bit of what the movie's about, and uh, it's probably the smallest it would be seen. And then uh, I started experimenting with different interpolations. Here's the regular, the display, the contrast increases, but the, the stem thickness stays about the same. And then black. Black is kind of where the magic started happening because uh, that's when I felt like it was really coming together and I was starting to see what this typeface could be. Uh, it was when I was talking to Dino that I didn't really know what this uh, I could do with the R. And it was when uh, he told me, well, why don't you make the leg a little bit more angular? And then that matches with the DNA of the rest of the typeface. And that's when it kind of all started also coming together again. And here it is as a interpolation. And here we have uh, black in just a few words, a captain, nautical, quirky. And then uh, here are just some more uh, characteristics of the typeface. You can see that these uh, really bizarre serifs, they kind of resemble like a fish fin or a fish tail. I thought that was really on brand with this film. And, uh, just another quote cool from the movie, the deeper you go, the weirder life gets. And more words, here's the display. It's also, at this point, it was like starting to come together just a little bit more. It's like I've got the regular, I've got the display, I've got the black display. Um, here it is again, and then this is where I took it another step further. I was like, okay, let's do italics. So here's regular italic. And then here, here's the same word in display, same word in black display, and then here it is with all of them together. And you can see that they share the same DNA and they're working together as a family. Regular, italic, display, black display, and then here they are uh, also again just showing how they work. And this is kind of where it all ended up. Is, I have these three axes where you can slide it, you can adjust the weight, you can adjust the contrast, and you can adjust the slant. And something that's really cool about it is I have these alternate layers so that when the slant uh, 
surpasses eight degrees, it becomes a true italic. It goes from oblique to a true italic. And here it is, just, um, for the final time, here's Aquaman.
the game is Mario. Yeah. I designed Billy Billy. That is a typeface that is inspired in the casual letters and a little bit of music. And it's not so casual. It's almost hand painted. And this is my inspiration. Uh, the inspiration comes from rockabilly posters, rockabilly music, sign painting. I'm from Mexico, so I have uh, many inspiration in the brush calligraphy, calligraphy, uh, italics, uh, brush, brush letters. And here are some of the of my first sketches. The idea was to make a text typeface, but uh, with a brush. There are some of the sketches. I have to sketch too much because uh, all my all my uh, all my letters were too much uh, calligra calligraphic italics. This was uh, <laughs> Jacobs approves because in one critique uh, I told him my brief that I want to make a typeface with a brush and all that. He likes pretty much that too. So the idea, I start with a humanistic model that you have to use a broad pen. This is of the materials that they use, the model, and then I like the casual letters that you have to do with a brush pen more fluid, more fun, more bold. So I try to do, I do a humanistic typeface, do this with the, with a brush paint. So I combined the two styles and this was the board of Billy Billy, first type, the, the first uh, sketches. Then I draw more sketches and the critique was, it is too Italic, we, we, we need a text typeface, uh, that, that uh, is not going to work. Then I draw more, they are too, they, they are too thin, so, uh, and I do them a little bit more heavy, and they are too brushy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, then I, I do it in, in leaves. Then the idea was, uh, what, what can I do? Then I'm gonna do a, another style. So I did this, that uh, it's more, uh, more subtle, uh, mean, uh, less fun, less calligraphic, less brushy, but it didn't work. It was too mechanic because of all my drawings were uh, very organic. And then this is Billy Billy regular, Billy Billy black. And uh, here are some characteristics. It has its reverse, reverse contrast, but not so reverse. So it's like a little, a little hint. The movement was very important in this typeface because of the rockabilly, the dance. It has to, to, to have this feeling that, that is moving. So it has movement in new stroke. And uh, I couldn't get uh, uh, the brush, uh, the brush strokes out. So it has some, some details like the, the label they are and some other letters that is like a, a brush stroke and to make to make it uh, more human uh, not to lose personality more hand handmade uh, it has many curved details and uh, the capital letters are small but not so small so they are ideal for for text because when you read it, uh, the capital letters don't distract from, from the lowercase. So here is the, a text with all the sizes of the weights. The black, the semi bold light, thin, extra light, uh, capitals. 
Then I do the interpolation. I have to draw the regular, that is the, the one in the middle that has inverse contrast, the light one that is almost a monoline, and the black letter that is a regular black letter. So it all interpolates. Uh, these are all the all the way to the path from black to thin, from thin to black. This is Bilibili in use. Um, it's uh, it reminds like the concert posters that you can find in, in every street. That's why the specimen that it's in the back, you can take one and uh, you can fold it as you want, do it like uh, play it so. Uh, then I try to do, I do an italic, but not the regular italic. It, this one uh, is more brushy, like I want. And try to make an upright, uh, the same as the, the with brush layers. So these are some characters. I'm gonna try to continue. And muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, so let's talk about Chappelle. So it's a display type case, uh, display type family inspired by the Rayan and Gothic architecture of Saint Chappelle. And uh, a bit about the inspiration. So type design for me was love at first sight uh, when I was in my sophomore year, so was Saint Chappelle. So I visited this place just a day before summer 23 began and it was love at first sight. It was gorgeous. So I, I was charmed by the high-rising gothic ceilings, the solemn silence, the light flooding in pools of red, uh, blue, and orange through the stained glass. It was just beautiful. So I decided to make a typeface that is inspired by Saint-Chapelle. And as the first step, uh, what I did was I looked at, you know, uh, came up with like uh, keywords on what represents the architecture of Saint-Chapelle. So before that, I also looked at the history of Saint-Chapelle. So to speak a bit about it, it's a 13th century uh, Rayan and Gothic uh, royal chapelle. It was commissioned by um, St. Louis to house his collection of uh, the relics from the Passion of Christ, including the Town of Thrones. That's why you have keywords like regal, sacred, ornate, uh, tranquil, soaring ceilings, light and delicate like the stained glass. And the next step was to map the, the Rayan period to uh, calligraphic styles that were pre prevalent in that uh, timeline. But uh, this was just a starting point. Uh, this was not to restrict myself with the um, historic time periods, but to look at you know different styles that resonate the most with the previously mentioned keywords. And I decided to go with uh, Rustica and Rotunda. Rustica because it's tall, very slender strokes. It's like the delicate lightness of it. It shows the height of the building and also the delicate lightness of. Uh, stained glass and rotunda because because of the clean round proportion it gives that sense of peace and tranquility and from that I started my foundational calligraphy exercise and just to set the mood uh, and then that formed the basis of the initial sketches so for me the upper case was from rustica which is sort of like reverse stress and the lower case was from rotunda which is uh, like vertical stress but 
now I had like two different stresses. So it was suggested by Sandrine that, you know, I can define the masters in the stress axis where, um, you know, I can come up with like, with my existing uh, reverse stress lowercase, I came up with the uppercase and vice versa where I had the initial uppercase, which was reverse stress, which was rustica. And then I sort of derived the lowercase from that. Um, and now the next step for me was to unify the rustica and rotunda into one system. So as you can see on the left, you see the calligraphic uh, references that I had and I had to introduce things like adding those signature serifs and, you know, um, harmonizing the weight and contrast to make it look like, uh, you know, a, a, the same system. Um, and also I came up with a third master, which is uh, condensed because this really brings forth the verticality and the tall soaring ceilings aspect of saint Chapel. Um, and yes, here are my signature features for my typeface. So as you can see, there are sharp calligraphic cuts to evoke the feeling of stained glass. And, you know, I also beat in the rustica swashes to mimic, mimic the ornateness. And uh, the serifs are kept very subtle so that it accentuates the feeling of height again. Um, and yes, here is my regular glyph set. Um, and this is the family that I developed. So as you can see, I interpolated between the regular and the reverse uh, stress and I got like a low contrast, um, monolinear, uh, um, semi-reverse, which can be used for like text purposes. Then here is the condensed and an italic that I explored. And here is the whole family. Um, and yes, this is the texture for the regular and this one is for semi-stress. Uh, sorry, semi-reverse, uh, this is for uh, reverse, and here's the texture for the condensed. And here is how the interpolation works, and three masters with the semi-reverse um, interpolation um, for like uh, some of the uppercase letter forms, and here is for some of the lowercase <coughs> letter forms. And yes, coming to use cases, I tried very quickly designing like uh, website redesign for saint Chapel using the condensed as the heading display and using the semi-reverse for the body text. And yes, um, some other applications that I could think of was what if it would be fun to get a ticket like this when we come back from saint Chapel. And then yes, these are some uh, type specimens again just to bring forth that, to, to see how it works in, in the context ultimately. Um, and yes, one more, and that's it. That's my typeface. Mm -hmm. Boundaries 
between uh, science uh, and poetry uh, are um, really blurred. And so, for example, uh, Jean Lafayette or Victor Hugo or uh, Walt Whitman, uh, they trace uh, scientific researches and mathematical um, revolutions and astronomy and whatever in their poems. And so my ambition uh, was to create a structured uh, typeface based on really geometric uh, principles, while um, also um, like reflecting the lightness and the sensitivity of poetry. So to achieve this, uh, I laid myself on a typeface called uh, Roman Roi. Uh, it's a typeface from the 17th uh, century, uh, who was commissioned by uh, the king Louis XIV. Um, uh, when Dino uh, came, one of uh, our type critics, he told me a story. He, he said to me, uh, Louis XIV was so afraid of his betrayal that he kept his court really close to him in Versailles, and that he commissioned the typeface um, to for like, official documents and to um, avoid typographic fraudsters. <laughs> so the Montreux stands out for its uh, pro proper proportions, for its regularity, for its ge geometry and modularity, and for me it was perfect. Uh, to represent uh, science. For the poetic aspect, uh, I wanted to exploit um, the characteristics of italics, and so I found this uh, specimen um, in one of the libraries we had the chance to visit. I don't remember which one, uh, but I uh, fell in love uh, with this one, with that how beautiful it is. And so, uh, here uh, begins my uh, researches. So always trying to keep the structure of Roman uh, Roi, but trying to add some flexibility, some lightness. Here is an example, uh, trying uh, different uh, series, like less strict than Roman uh, Roi. And so here is my first draft. <laughs> so you can see that um, the earlier versions of imps, they had a lot of angles in the rounded shapes, and um, not everywhere, so it doesn't make any sense, but uh, eventually I, <laughs> I removed them, because I'm not in Tokyo too. <laughs> so, so, here's my book. Uh, so it was a final review with uh, Jean-Francois, um, and my feedback still looks like this. <laughs> so finally, uh, meet uh, Xé. So uh, I kept the original series uh, of Comment Roi. I reduced uh, the contrast to make it look more like a text typeface. I also shortened the ascenders and descenders and the caps to modernize the typeface. So here is uh, the complete uh, glyph set, including punctuation, numbers, and I also designed some accents, even for Esperanto, that no one cares about. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here is uh, two of my favorite letters, because of their little legs like this, like they are dancing. <laughs> and here is some text, so you can see how it works. In the best. Um, here is my book with some very famous uh, Jean Francois uh, sentences. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here is the interpolation. So I have six grades light, uh, regular, medium, simple, both, and extra both. And finally, I designed also um, the italic, who was. Um, like really important to me because I think it feels really poetic, I guess. And I designed also some uh, some swashy alternates to write beautiful poems about science. <laughs> and here's a little uh, exhibition leaflet. And voila, 
this is my uh, specimen. And um, thank you. So now we put on the table. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, so today uh, I will present the work we created. So the context it was making a typeface for the Barbican. So the Barbican uh, is complex, a big area in the center of London. Um, it's very like uh, literally a uh, city on the city. Um, it's uh, very brutalist, uh, very uh, big grid, and I would like to make the typeface for this area. Uh, yeah. uh, this complex, they have a estate on it, and as well um, an art center, so they have a cinema, a uh, restaurant, bar, and stuff with the refuge. Uh, that I really like the contrast between so uh, in the city, uh, our London, and here, so it's very make uh, very contrast, and they have a big tension uh, on the shape because only it's a big uh, shape in the concrete form, and as well like some make some fluidity, uh, and we can see here like the conservatory, uh, it's making a very very good atmosphere in this picture. I really like. Um, so the start point for the typeface is to, to have some keyword, so as a brutalist, to contrast radical, concrete, and tension to reflect the, the typeface. Um, so I start with the calligraphy, uh, where we saw some uh, contrast on the form. Um, some are very, very geometric, uh, some are more fluid, just to try to represent the atmosphere. Um, here I, I play so with two different things. So some forms are very, very, very uh, condensed. Some are very, uh, <coughs> very large to play as well for the legibility and to try to be um, to be delusional a bit, uh, laser to represent the the barbican. Um, so Jean Francois. <laughs> Me and he told me, yes, it works. So I was very <laughs> surprised and happy to play with a like, very delusional shape uh, as a very contrasted. Um, so I started on it. I make a lot, a lot of tracing paper uh, of calligraphy uh, with very, very to play with a, with a large, uh, extended, very, very condensed uh, shape at first with a by hand. Uh, and uh, um, as well, I really like to play, so just very quick, I do that. Uh, I was very happy because for me it was just an experimentation, uh, I do that for the, for the weekend. But when the one day when I showed that as a tutor, uh, people told me to just calm down, clever. <laughs> so first we need to have like one regular weight and not uh, for a family for the moment. So. Uh, I was working on the, the regular way, so it was not a regular, but my main way is uh, it was a condensed light. Um, so it's here. Um, then here with uh, some texture. Um, so we can fit here uh, some brutalist stamina, some radical and geometric shape, uh, with a calligraphy shape, just to remind. Uh, that we need to have the tension between the radicality of the, the concrete shape and as well the fluidity as a, as a flower and the, the leaf uh, inside. So the design space, we work on it, we can call as well uh, in the playground. I really like to play with kind of stuff. So here is a weight. 
so maybe you can have so the little <laughs> bit of <your> there. <laughs> you can guess maybe who is it. <laughs> <laughs> so here the design space is came from the light um, condensed to the black condensed. Uh, so I decided to to redraw it to redraw uh, in calligraphy to make the black version. So that's very helpful uh, to really go on the calligraphy with different tools, more uh, more heavy to get a different shape. And that uh, we learn here, and that Jean-François said always, the importance is the white space. So we need to be very, very, very uh, <laughs> in the white space. That is very important. So to evince some research, there are some part of pizza and flaming uh, here, so <laughs> different team. Um, so uh, this is uh, so when the, the weight um, like come for the condensed light and condensed uh, ball here. Um, but I ask myself if it's enough. So I think it's never enough. So we need to continue. So basically, we write uh, just one uh, one way. So we had uh, a, a third master, so with the width, um, and see what happened. So this is the extended black um, here. This makes sense. And what happened in the middle? At this time, I was a bit uh, frustrated because at the middle it was not what I expected. Because uh, I think it's it lose uh, something there, some uh, interesting shape, but it was not enough to, to be happy. Um, so this uh, is just when we make the, um, so between uh, the three uh, master. But here, what's happened? So we <laughs> decided to make the extended light uh, version as well, so the four master uh, to play with. Uh, and this is uh, the group family. So the group family came from the, the, the light uh, extended, from the board extended, and the, the condensed and the condensed light. <laughs> so um, so uh, this is uh, all the families, so condensed light until uh, the barbican. Extended uh, extra black. This is some features. They have some alternate, so three different A, uh, one E different, and some different S as well. Uh, some cool um, glyphs to play. And this you can imagine now uh, how we can use of the Barbican uh, can use for the communication. So thank you everyone for this six weeks. It was good. or a gift, which I think it makes sense for me because I'm here uh, thanks to Capcom once again, so thank you very much. Um, so Akias is a book cafe family. Um, so my mom um, is a literature teacher 
and she has a lot of research book at home that has very weird Vietnamese accents placement. Um, so I took one to cut ties and um, give myself a brief, which is a design challenge, where I hope I can fix uh, all of these accent problems, as we can see, um, they are not as apparent as it should be. Some um, tend to lose its legibility when it's in small size, and I don't think it should be like that because it's a part of our language, you know, like two accent layers and stuff. And so, um, I have some inspiration in mind. Um, I don't because it's a book topic, so I have to say really simple. And so I come in here, I have one goal, is to have my um, basic rights. And I think, uh, and book topics is also one of the things I really like to do. And um, so as you can see here, uh, mostly reference of italic with splashes, because like Emma and Kelly, I like splashes. <laughs> and uh, and here's my starting points. So I would advise to um, start straight out with doing calligraphy in Vietnamese with uh, different accenters uh, to see how it would work for my language. Um, and so I start with also with numbers and italic. And then I have a sketch. Um, these are the letters that I sketches with that I put it on top. Um, and so we, well, book up is supposed to be easy. I think it was easy, but it was not. Um, it was a lot of rework, more than I thought it should be. I know, and no offense, but, <laughs> but it's, it's a lot. I, I just don't think um, we should, like, there, there's so much work coming behind, and um, up to a point where I think I'm being. That uh, I'm trying to stay strong after a bunch of free work, and here we have feedbacks on structures and guest critics and punctuation, explorations, and so on. And uh, yeah, it's, it was a great challenge. Um, and so, my third feature is quite simple um, with an um, angle um, pointing out like this, and with uh, an even slope, like uh, on the on the right is shown on the left. And um, um, my uh, uh, capital is very close to Roman letters, and so I have this uh, very slightly curve on top of uh, these capital letters um, to have feelings. Um, design structure, very basic with two drops on the whole. Um, and um, uh, different passages. Um, yeah, and the concept is um, to have two accenters in one family. One will work for Latin language or the language that has one accent layer, uh, and one will work specifically more for Vietnamese that we can start to um, two layers of accents. Uh, but because in Vietnamese we only have one accent, uh, one layer accent for the descender, and so the descender stays the same. And so I have this concept for Fats Jacob, uh, who is a guest critic, and he showed me the work of Trinité, where you have two different um, accenters and descenders that you that you can accommodate different things to 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 your topics, and it opens up a Opportunity, like a new perspective for me in type design, like it kind of solved my design challenge. Um, and so here is the uh, full family that I developed for my book. And as you can see, uh, you go from light to black, and then there's a Vietnamese with a higher accent. And um, what I focus on the most during this this course is uh, the book and it's italic and it's what I'm quite proud of. Um, and so this is the basic Latin set. Uh, yeah. <coughs> and we also have the Vietnamese set with very 
um, I was also advised to have a uh, um, specific communication that we work with Vietnamese, and so I, I thought of two, but it was a very interesting idea. Thanks, Matthew. So I think I will we'll continue to look at it and find new opportunity for my language. Um, and so it is a string of text, so you can see the texture uh, of my work, and so typography access to other content. And so we move to text setting for French language. Um, and so for Vietnamese, so on the right is the web accents for my mom's book, and on the left is my rework, which I hope that uh, that it works for my language and is accepted. Um, here is the literature. I think in fact design without literature would be very boring. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it doesn't have feelings, there's no emotion behind it. And so I have uh, yeah, I have a lot of stuff in literature. Um, like this. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> um, the names of the creatures, uh, instructors that helped me a lot this year. Uh, thank you so much. I'm sorry, Mike, I forgot your view on your last name. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, um, I learned a lot during this six weeks, and I feel like I've been feeling a new pair of eyes almost. Um, and um, here is the um, uh, location in for Vietnamese, and underneath you have the italic. Um, in English, do you know what it means? And here's another version. And so, if, you, if I can sum up what I have learned in Paris in one photo, it would be oh, not yet. Okay. <laughs> here's, the, here's the application. Um, what, what, for a book cover, for example, that works for, for Vietnamese. And here is some um, book. Okay. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> 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 so, hello, uh, I'm going to present you my face, uh, which is called Titaness. Uh, so, we need to know, first of all, why Titaness? Um, so, uh, I used to live in Normandy and uh, born in Cherbourg. And uh, the fact is that in Cherbourg we have uh, we had a chance to the chance I don't know but we had a chance to to to, to go to the Titanic uh, uh, at our port. So uh, I was really interested by the story since the beginning when I, when I was a child, and uh, I wanted to go a little bit more. And when I got the opportunity to create a typeface, I brought directly to the of the Titanic because, uh, yeah, since I'm a child, uh, it's, it's something that I like. So, uh, so I wanted to explore more uh, the interior design of the Titanic. And um, as you can see, we, we have some uh, ornaments, uh, some beautiful things with, which are really um, delicate and uh, in, uh, in another way. We have the Titanic himself, uh, which is really uh, old uh, inside, for example, and huge. So I had to find a way to to get this contrast in a side face, so huge and also delicate. Uh, I was quite lost when uh, when I, I was searching for my reference, but I found different things uh, that was not so the same. Uh, on the uh, one hand, we had a whole face with a huge serif and uh, something really uh, mechanical, and on the other hand, we had uh, something really sushi with uh, miniatures and uh, beautiful stuff, so like uh, the inside of the Titanic. So, okay, but how can I manage to get both of uh, the feelings in a one typeface? Uh, so I started drawing some style, uh, some style like with a uh, thin serif and a uh, really sharpy one. But every time I get some feedback, it was never uh, enough. Like it was too small, too sharp, too wide, too too much. 
So uh, I was quite lost uh, at the beginning because it was my first like place ever in my life. So I had the feeling of a professor, and I felt like the Titanic. <laughs> like the Titanic. So uh, I took I took back my, myself and I said, okay, so what I'm going to do now and. Um, so uh, I, I remember the first thing, thing that I got from Titanic is uh, uh, the Titanic himself. So I went back to the, to the first wall and I look at the shape of the ship. And then uh, I look at all the, uh, all the shape uh, from one part to another part. And I found out interesting the, this, the, 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 this part of the Titanic. Uh, with the angular shapes and also with uh, those round corners, so huge and compact. And that's what I wanted for my uh, typeface. So uh, I ended up with ceramics which are huge and compact as a uh, Titanic uh, itself. So as you can see the curves, but with also this slanted uh, ending of the ceramic. And then uh, I took as inspiration. Uh, I don't know what's the name of this object, but it was it used to be in the old boat and the Titanic with uh, different uh, typeface. And then that's um, my family ended up like that. So I started with um, some slanted italic uh, typeface to a uh, extra black uh, typeface to, to get the really um, to get the setting of, uh, of the Titanic. So this is my family. Um, so yeah, from the outside to the extra black. So the outside represents uh, the inside of the boat with this delicate string, and uh, the extra black for uh, the hugeness of the boat itself. So here are the different examples for my uh, typeface. Um, so you can see the different letters. I have some difficulty to create some letters like uh, for the key, for example, like the key at the beginning. So. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me feedback uh, many, many, many times. Um, so here, uh, here you have the, the typeface uh, of your regular, and then uh, I have some um, uh, extra black, uh, italic, a black ball, uh, all the all the family inside. So uh, a few of these uh, that I had at the end. Um, as you can see, I started to add also some uh, little splashes on the, some letters that you can see after. Uh, so this is the regular of the group set. Um, yeah. And the uh, italic, the, the more slanted. And the fun fact is that uh, I try to set it as much as the different shape of the titanic was. And some alternates, so we swoosh uh, uh, letters. Some example, and thanks to Matthew and Alvin for uh, giving me uh, these uh, ideas of the, the, the swoosh swashes. So. And the extra back. So, yeah, here are my three uh, different ingredients uh, of my typeface so regular, italic, extra back. So yeah, it was quite nice uh, for the Titanic, but not quite as much for my So one more space for that. So because uh, at the end of the video, you don't know if Jack would uh, draw the Titanic to go off, but I don't think so. So yeah. Merci. And now we have chess. Uh, I'm Chess, I'm a designer from uh, the US. Um, I came to France uh, for two reasons. Uh, one was type Paris, obviously, that's why we're all here. Um, but also, I had uh, a second uh, agenda. I had a, uh, a, a mission, or a, I guess um, a, a pilgrimage to make to a city that had been on my list for a long time. Um, 
Soissons is one of the oldest cities in France. It dates back to 300 AD. It's uh, the site of the first Catholic mission. Um, that's uh, Saint uh, Arnold. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it was liberated by Joan of Arc in uh, a couple centuries after that. It uh, was also one of the major sites outside of Paris of the French Revolution. Uh, it uh, has a long story you know, past. Uh, it also obviously was the site of quite a bit of construction during World War I. Um, turns out that uh, uh, during this struggle, this was also the site of the turning point of the war. Uh, you know, the Germans had been advancing all through France, and the uh, Americans finally joined in 1918 in uh, February. And my uncle uh, was part of that that reversal. He helped uh, kind of hold the line in July of uh, 1918. And uh, I also only recently discovered who this guy is. Uh, I found a photograph in my basement uh, when I was or in my parents' basement. And uh, it it really you know was humbling to go see uh, and visit the cemetery that he was buried in, the military cemetery run by. Uh, the United States uh, uh, battle, battle Commission. Um, and uh, it was, uh, you know, my, my wife and I were actually the first to go visit his grave. Um, we met up with um, the, the administrator, Kurt Kalud, who was an ex Marine, uh, ex Marine sergeant. And uh, he was so friendly. We came unannounced and he guided us to the gravesite of my great uncle. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have any photos of my wife here, but uh, but Kurt was a super helpful guy. He was very nice. Uh, but it was also, you know, he, he adorned the, the cross and he did all this. Uh, what was also moving was seeing, looking down a row of, of headstones and seeing the same date across the board. And then turning behind you, 300 meters in that direction, everyone died that same week. Uh, it really is, you know, you don't need to be religious or, you know, Ra Ra America to be a little moved by that. Uh, so it affected me. And it was also, I think, quite impressive were the grounds. They meticulously maintained these grounds. They, you can see they were amazing. Uh, but there's also this monument at the end of the cemetery. Uh, that's this, um, you know, they always have a, a wreath to the unknown soldier. And on the left side, there is uh, a wall of uh, the missing. And then on the right side, there is this, uh, this really cool map room. And you, as you enter, you're confronted with this beautiful map on this great side. And at the time, I had just been in Thai Paris for a week, I think, and they said, you know, Jean Francois, I was like, okay, you gotta pick your, you know, you have to pick your, your theme. I was like, I threw a couple out, and I was like, no. And I see this, and I'm like, this is it. I wasn't expecting to do a revival of anything, but this really spoke to me. Uh, the type here, you can kind of zoom in a little bit, had this very you know, wide bowls, very high. Um, X height, and it really spoke to me. And I felt like this is it. It's, this is the you know, cross section of tight Paris and, and this, this mission that I have. So, um, and I, I thought, well, I could also marry this with the caps on the other side. Uh, this would be, I think, an experiment because even though these two things do come from two different typographic traditions, uh, they weren't really consistent within the same architecture. I thought, well, maybe that could be my mission to marry these two things uh, in in uh, a context that made sense for this space. And maybe, also, uh, you know, the United States Battle Monuments Commission might be interested in taking this on as something that would unify the website, uh, the ministry museum that they have at these sites, and you know, possibly an app or something like this. So uh, off to the races. Um, I decided, you know, as I said, I was going to make the map room the basis of the lowercase, and the capitals the basis of, uh, of the from the wall I'm missing uh, to be the basis of the caps. So I asked John Francois, I was like, I really want to go back out there and I want to do rubbings. You know, do you think that's a good idea? And he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, a day later I asked him again, I said, I really want to go out there and do rubbings. Do you think that's a good idea? He said, sure, yeah, you should absolutely do that. <laughs> so I um, went out there and he was he was right. Um, in the process of putting out a typeface. Stone rubbings you know, look really cool. That's really impressive. I know I get extra credit for that. But it really did not you know, help with actually rendering the face. It was nice for me to, to rub the stone, and it was, I think, a tactile experience. It was meaningful to me. 
But in terms of executing a typeface, uh, if anybody ever is tempted to do this, waste of time. <laughs> um, so it was off to the races. It was off to start drawing. Um, so I did some just some quick sketches on some words that I thought kind of resonated with me. Just did some you know quick you know very small sketches to get like, a feel of what I was going for. It's like oh this, this is good. This is really working. It's coming together. And I you know pulled off some of these resources. Just you know pulled them off from the from the photographs that I had. Started doing drawings and things were fine, but they started to kind of go because I had to straighten it out. I couldn't I couldn't let it be. It wasn't in italics. Not really. So by straightening it out, it started to lose some of its character. And then the more I drew it, it began to kind of lose more of its character. And the thing that kept throwing me for a loop was this E. And I could not get it to work. No matter how many times I redrew it, it was just not work. So I said, okay, put a pin in that, move on, hit something that I can maybe, you know, realize really well. This is a case where the stone rowings actually work pretty well. Um, I decided to reference you know, these open bowls that I saw a lot in the numerals especially. Uh, the, the six had this really nice open bowl and the eight also had that. I decided to import that to some of the capitals, have an open bowl in the R and an open bowl in the B. And, you know, reduce a little bit of the, you know, the value of the B a little bit and take that, tap, tap that down a little bit so that it's more consistent with the lowercase. Um, and then bring it back to the E so I could let that have its fun again. It's the only lowercase letter that has an open ball. And it still gets to be unique, but it is a little toned down and it works with the rest of the alphabet. Uh, the thing with typography is uh, you have to, you can't really let anyone, you know, the problem child uh, not fit in with the rest of the family. The problem child has to adjust to the family. Um, so uh, that's what I learned with this. It also, at times, is a bit like a, like a Ouija board. The thing would just be, the typeface would be going in a certain direction without more control, it seemed like. Sometimes it actually went off the table and I had to retreat and uh, start over. So it, uh, it was a great learning experience. It was it taught a lot uh, about how type works, how it has a mind of its own sometimes. You're, you're guiding it, but it's gonna go its own way. Um, so this is the final phase. Uh, this is what I arrived at. Um, it, I think accomplished what I tried to do, which is to marry those two disciplines, marry the two styles that I saw in the, the map room and the wall missing that day. Uh, but also, you know, is evocative of the 1920s, has that feel. It's also not too silly, it, but it has, I think, a kindness to it that reminds me of my, my great uncle when I saw his face. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe it can be used in an app or something that wouldn't uh, you know, require uh, the administrator of the cemetery to come give you a tour to the gravestone. Maybe there's you know, something that would take you there. And why, how great would it be if there was a, you know, a typeface that matched the look of the premises that you were on, right? So, uh, you know, maybe that typeface would be something like Swasson. Um, and we're also going to learn to say this word. 
So if you're French, translate like that. And if you speak English, you can translate like that, which is far. So everyone can repeat after me. I'm going to say far, and you're going to say far, far, far. So you're probably wondering what far means. And one of the big sort of overarching things that as Pacific Islanders we're really into is this idea of home and welcoming people into our home. So far, I think about the fact that we home. Um, at the start of this project, one of the things that was suggested to me was to do research on every single thing in French Polynesia. Um, <coughs> French Polynesia is a lot more south than where I'm from, and so I had no clue what the culture would be like at all, but I found that it's very similar to the culture that I come from. Um, and so I was looking at references that were felt very, very similar and felt like home, like far. Uh, looking at both print, like modern print, some banknotes, um, looking at architecture, indigenous architecture, looking at fish hooks, looking at textiles and ways of making those textiles, looking at tattoos and ways to make tattoos. Um, and one of the first things I did was go through and look at sort of those shapes and just kind of blindly draw and recreate those shapes. Um, and so looking at, again, those, the way the hammer sort of arches back, some of the fish hook hooks, and some of the islands themselves, the way those are shaped. Um, and that led me to here, looking at this tension between the inner and outer curves. And this was also the point where I was looking at the typeface, and other people were looking at the typeface, and I was like, does it feel right to do, to take tattoos and fish hooks, this indigenous art, and put it on top of a Latin typeface? And I was really struggling internally thinking about, okay, well, what is the good use of Latin for a colonized society? It allows us to continue our language and to write it down, not just have it be orally transmitted. But at the same time, we're sort of honoring people that came in and took things from us but also gave us things. And so part of that, to me, I was like, okay, I'm gonna sleep on it, maybe not gonna do that just tonight, which is a sin, apparently, in my Paris world. Um, and so I did sleep on it, and the next morning, I was looking through, trying to learn more Tunisian, and I found this phrase, which was which, very complex phrase, but we're all gonna learn, we're all gonna learn. So it's Manava. Manava. Which is it's equal to my event, which is welcome. So Manava. Manava. Ite. Ite. Far. Far. Yeah, combining many sentences. So Manava to Far. One last time. Manava um, And so for me, what I had to do was sort of not think about the artifacts, not think about colonization, not think about that, just return back to the Greek. I was making a typeface for a museum, and so let's go back to this museum. Um, and I was looking at the shapes of the building itself, the architecture. Um, I did go back and look at the reference from the new wing, which was done by a Parisian architecture firm. And what they had done was do this glass facade. So in a way, it was like, okay, we are present, we are here taking up space, but at the same time, we want you to look back and reflect on what is here and what exists here. And for me, that reflected back on the Tahitian beach. So for all of you thinking about the Paris beach, I was at the Tahitian beach every day enjoying that. So, and with that, I came up with a typeface that was honestly a lot more boring than I thought it would be. Um, and I was okay with that. I was okay with that because I think in the end, if you're doing typeface for a museum, it probably is going to be boring. No offense to museum clubs out there, but that's okay. And so we're drawing on vellum, doing sketches, and I landed somewhere that looked like this for my O, which it is a little wonky and that's slightly purposeful because handmade things aren't supposed to be made perfect. And so looking back on like tradition and culture, perfect things don't exist. Um, referencing sort of that flat shape again, going back to the architecture, and we had these curves that are a lot more flat than they are round. And then we can see the nice and chunky to reference back those the logs that were holding up parts of the building. One of the last things was to introduce this cup at the bottom of the serif, 
when it was flat, it felt very lifeless, but putting in this cup, it created this rhythm throughout the text that was really nice. And so the design space looked like this. It was a thin tool. Um, felt very proud that I could do two masters and I could get a so shot to look like this. And it feels pretty solid to me. But of course, that's not enough. Um, and so we pushed it a little further and we explored doing a sans to go with it. Because if you're thinking about a traditional building, of course, with Sarah, but then a contemporary wing, maybe a sans is needed in play. And then in between that, there's the semi serif that lies again in between, and that all interplays as well. Yeah. Um, and of course, that's not enough because if you're going to do translations, you're probably going to need to point out like, that it needs, to, it needs to come out in the text. So I did an italic as well. So I was working with six masters, which is something I have never done before, and I've never done italic. Um, and I think it came out pretty nice. So the whole family itself is a serif, which was the main weight that I was working with, the main master I was working with. Then we had the songs, and then we had the semi serif, which one of my favorite ways is the far is semi serif demi bold. Um, fun fact, I had to change demi semi bold to demi bold. Semi serif came in, so it wasn't far as semi serif, semi cold, which is a mouthful. <laughs> and then the italic, of course. So the whole family ended up looking like this. It was 20 fonts across the serif, a semi, a sans, and italic, and all of it is very cool. And in use, I made some arrows because if you're in a museum, you get lost real quick. So nice little break from looking at letters. In text and in the interpolation, fun little thing that I dropped on the last session. <laughs> um, very proud of the work I did over six weeks. Didn't think I would get here with the big block of like, should you do something that's colonized? Um, this is okay. We got there and we made it to the end, and we're going to learn one last word, or like two words. That's Maururu Go. Oh, that was perfect. Don't need to do it again. Okay, one last thing before I go. Okay, ready? Okay. So, okay. Oh, the lines. Okay. I'll do it one more time. I can assure you, I don't have as many weights, no, not as many variations. Uh, but uh, my introduction slide is not the name of my typeface, we'll get to that later sometime. Um, I think this quote by Henry Matisse simply sums up that Paris for me. Uh, I have always tried to hide my efforts and wish that my work to have a light joy since the springtime. Uh, because nobody should know the labors it has cost us. Uh, like Dustin mentioned, uh, it is uh, not working in the night, it's considered a sin attack. Uh, as the quote goes, Hindi Matisse is one of my favorite artists. Um, it's like a sort of like when they pick up a theme, I have to find something that was the cross junction of many of my interests. I would say, like France right now. Uh, paper cuts, Henry Matisse, if you've followed my work for a while, you know I'm very, very interested in paper cutouts. I've been a graphic designer for 12 years. And the other side is me trying to unlearn a lot of graphic design. As I went along, the more I did type design, the more I realized that, yes, it's important, but I had to learn, unlearn a lot of it. Uh, there were very interesting parts about Matisse's cutouts that I uh, had never observed, even though I've been such a big fan of his work. Um, there were lots of things about front spacing. You can see Matthew drawing up there. Uh, there was uh, a lot of understanding of what regular typefaces, a black reverse stretch. I learned all the things I did not know. I thought I learned in grad school. Uh, but there are things uh, that I was told every day was uh, all over the place. 
this is another quote by Matisse that I thought was really nice, which also reflects back to that design. Cutting into color reminds me of a sculptor's direct carving. Um, and I thought that was really relevant to uh, being a Dutch designer as well, because you needed to know, especially when we went to Lyon and we went to the museum. I'm not going to try to pronounce anything in French uh, because I'm going to be telling a little bit. So, uh, but that uh, was a study point. And this is who we are today. I do think uh, there was lots of uh, interesting dates, variations, things. Um, this is the name of my typeface, Beat and Lee. The first. Uh, any references to uh, people living or dead does not mean anything, especially in terms of royalty, because we have long colonized uh, about 90 years. Um, Henry the first has many things. There has smooth curves that ended up, uh, you know, meet sharp ends. There was an interesting junction um, and loops from Matisse's cutouts that I tried to borrow into the work. Uh, we had to keep it slightly approachable and friendly because. Uh, his work was very um, energetic, there was a lot of color, uh, there were a lot of offset shapes, no things that followed rules, uh, so it was really hard to marry with the type design. Um, there were lots of ink trap interventions which I tried to add into my work, which I was consistently told that don't be a graphic designer, and I was like, okay. Um, and then the asymmetrical serif, because I don't think you can cut the same thing twice, correct? The same thing. Um, that's how it looks in text. Um, and then of course we have to go further because you don't have to stop at one gate. So meet Henry the second. Like royal families, we continue to call them Henry. Um, and Henry the second is all about spring and summer, a lot more like Matisse's work. It's super large, super bright, super uh, vivacious, energetic. There's a lot going on in every um, letter. And then, of course, we interpolated because the family has to grow, the royals love uh, everything. So, this Matisse, the more the merrier. Um, it's, uh, so, I had a few weights, one italic, like I said, it's much smaller than Dustin. Um, and then, of course, every family also has something that doesn't work with the family. So, we have a reverse dress that borrows some elements from the main that face, but is uh, different. Um, they have very heavy horizontal strokes, striking strong loops. Uh, there were inverse counterpoints. This is thanks money to the tip uh, for you know helping me change that. I, I felt like it would add a lot more dimension to that face. Uh, there were cursive flourishes, asymmetrical serifs, and there was this asymmetrical joint, which I was told was a complete no no in E, but I simply did it anyway. Um, this is how it would look if it was sort of you know blown up uh, into things. You could do things, more things with it. You can see me having fun with graphic design. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think my summation of most of the work that I did here was uh, both for me from a drawing perspective, art, that design, is that drawing is like making an expressive gesture with the advantage of permanence. Um, like Marie said it, and I think that truly reflects both in the work and how we, um, I got the opportunity to make something that I could call permanent, not really functioning it, but we'll see. Um, and yeah, he said my quotes are not crazy and I really respect that, you'll see it in the poster. Uh, that's Henry. Uh, and we're very, very close. I just couldn't help myself yeah. <laughs> that we could get to the Parisian beach tonight, even if it's on the sidewalk. This one's for you from the poster. Thank you. It's there. It's there. Oh. Yeah, it's for you.
Okay, so the name of my face is called uh, Mandakarun. I'm going to let you know what it means. You don't need to say it aloud. <laughs> um, Mandakarun is a Brazilian cactus and it's very well known in Brazil, Northeast. Um, it represents resilience and it also uh, it blooms at night, so it's also called the Queen of the Night. And it's subversive and northeast northeast of Brazil is uh, very has a suffered with a lot of drought. So the fruit from this cactus um, you know is really helpful to feed people and animals. So it, it has a very special meaning for the people in that area. So my berries, my name Marcel Kirky from Brazil, living in New York and you know, maybe in Europe, I don't know. <laughs> so the origin again, you know, it's the, you know, it's just the, the, the flower and it has a lot of art with a, like woodcut to represent the cactus and, you know, the fruit. So I think what the, you know, starting point for the name of the cactus. So the briefing was a little complicated because I really wanted to do something about protests, about posters, but at the same time, I wanted to have some Brazilian reference, and I had to unite both. And then I thought I had a good idea, but then someone was like, you need to be more, more specific with the briefing. And I was like, okay, more, yes. So then how about taking the woodcut, woodblock, uh, from the Brazilian pamphlets and also from the type uh, May 68 and talk about feminism and then like walking in Paris when I'm, you know, I was supposed to be doing night work but I couldn't resist. Um, there was like this, uh, a lot of weed facing posters and there is a lot of art, there is actually, you know, a lot to see and so I put everything in a bag, and that was my my inspiration. All my weights, you know, it's like a little chaotic, but also very meaningful because I also it was my first time designing a typeface. And to be honest, many many ages ago when I went to college in Brazil, I never had a type class. So. It's about, you know, it's a typeface that it's loud, that it's uh, about feminism, that, you know, has a, doesn't have the swashes and the curves, and it takes all the sharp angles from Emma's side. Thank you. So, but again, what would be the reference to work on? You know, I needed something, and most of the posters are uppercase and you know all some serifs and we had to work with serifs because that's how we learn so i started exploring like the shapes of the letters and, and the angles and this one was like particularly one that i could find lowercase and a lot of tracing paper and more tracing paper and more tracing paper so you can see the sharp angles and you know this funny serif that you know, it, it really comes from the end, from this holster, together with my left-handed calligraphy. And then the S, the E, and the T. And you hear a lot, a lot of fun, a lot of coffee, you know, that's the little cat where I was saying she said my homework, she said, no, it's Sunday, you're done. <laughs> and dessert, and coffee, and eclairs, because you have to make it fun. And then the italics, because as I said, I'm first, I left-handed, calligraphy, I had to do everything upside down. It was, took me a long time. I felt that I was behind the whole class all the time. I was talking to teachers. Yeah, it was, you know, a lot of conflict inside. So here is the complete glyph set um, I needed. And here is how it works. This is a song, uh, a Brazilian song that talks about Nanakaru. And here, like Fabi said, the graphic designer and playing, that's my toy. 
and taking some reference, thinking material, um, and trying to reproduce with the with typeface, woodcut, and then let's go in and in Portuguese. Again, playing, playing everything this morning. The G spot, the sexy G. <laughs> and here, creation, maybe in the future, you know, some will be revealed. And <coughs> Fabian is here, I'm looking for the creation beach. <laughs> Abraham is here. Until I got to a point where I got something that 
I thought would work nicely uh, to digitize. There were a lot of tracing paper results like this, a lot of analog copy paste to try and get to a point where it worked the way I wanted it to. And then I started to digitize. So this was the first version all the way through to the last, uh, really just kind of opening up the, the middle counter. Same with the P. Uh, with those basic glyphs, I could then transfer this to the corresponding glyphs, so the stems, the shoulders, same with the stems, the bowls, the bowls here, the circulars, uh, and the diagonals, the same kind of system. The G and the S. Um, <laughs> I don't think anyone ever finished that. Uh, I got to the point where I went to the numerals, so I drew them. And then changed them quite a bit because I wanted them to match the lowercase. So that's kind of where they ended. Uh, this is an example of the final kind of output in text, some words, and then the entire um, set. Just some linkages which were inspired from some of the visits we went to. Uh, and then I got time to kind of expand the design space. So I had a condensed thin, I wanted to go further with the weight. So again, drawing. I found this quite difficult. Um, we had a guest come in, Dino, who suggested that some people were attracted to either lighter shapes or darker. I think I'm definitely on the lighter side. I had a lot of trouble kind of getting the weight where it needed to be in these um, in these glyphs. Now a lot of design decisions in terms of like, you know, where does the weight go? Does it at the end, does it become a point? Come straight. Uh, so I played with those quite a bit. I uh, got to this as a final result. Uh, so now I had the condensed thin, condensed black, and I wanted to play with uh, the width. So again, drawing. Uh, again, I found this a bit easier because it was really just taking the thin and, and expanding. Uh, and then I got to something like this. Uh, and the white black, I didn't want to touch because I thought that would be good enough to get a regular. Uh, so as an example of the weight, and then an example of the width, uh, I tried to capture that the classmates um, corresponding cities to many Americans though, so I just put in New York. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the entire family. Uh, I also wanted to play with italics, so again, started to draw. Um, I kind of took a bit of a hybrid from the Roman and put it to the italic because I thought it would be a good idea for um, a display face to kind of mimic the same things. And I got that other case in my face, of course. Uh, I did some very quick mock ups, which uh, helps when you have amazing photography. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to John Casuar and Rumi uh, for creating Thai Paris and continuing me to do it. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to the guests, uh, critics, uh, the instructors that were with us here today. I learned a lot and it was amazing. And I definitely want to thank all my classmates who I share this experience with. Superstar, so you need two microphones. Hi, I'm Coco, um, and my paintings is called Bell Now. Uh, so, dude, that's not a good face. Um, but I want to do this a little bit. But 
Coming into Tech Paris, I kind of knew that I wanted a certain flavor in my new face, and I'm a brand designer, so I kind of wanted to do something that I knew I would want to use on a lifestyle brand that I would design someday, maybe. Um, and I wanted it to be editorial and fashionable and elegant, uh, but that wasn't enough of a hole for a brief. And so what I came up with to sort of guide me as a North Star was the character born in all the TV show Um And if you've seen it before, you know that she is a female assassin slash serial killer, um, but her sort of persona is very, like, she lives in Paris and she lives in life of luxury. And she's very elegant and sophisticated and feminine, um, but obviously she has a dangerous side. And I thought those descriptors also um, describe roses really well. They're very like uh, beautiful but thorny, and that was the kind of tension that I wanted to bring into my head face. So this feeling, and just a little bit of this feeling. <laughs> um, okay, I'm skipping over some things because I have a lot of slides, so. Um, Okay, so I started here, and obviously this is not all, all of this is the practice type base that we did in the first two weeks. Um, and I was starting to get a little attached to it actually, um, and Matthew and Julie suggested that I take it and use its structure, but turn it on. So I sketched and I just I kind of turned all those like soft bits sharp, um, narrowed the proportions quite a bit. Um, I realized that I have like the brand designer's tendency to like make all my F's and Q's and R's like, way too narrow. Um, but I saw that later. And this is a little bit too intense, like it's a little too slashy, it doesn't have as much of elegance. And so what I ended up with was something between these two. And so these were my scans, my final scans of my regular wave. And so what I thought I was going to do is scan these and turn them into my regular in clips. But I was told to digitize the light and black version. I never actually digitized the regular version that I drew. Um, and so I, Rainer is not here. Please never look at this. But um, <laughs> I wrote an illustrator, and that's where I just like tried to figure out how I was going <laughs> to um, take those drawings and make a light and a black. And I just feel like I messed up more illustrator. That's why I use illustrator. <laughs> Um, and this was just one one day on June 26th. I didn't actually save a file. I have no other saved files in this reader, but copy pasted it into this. And as with everyone, we're going to some interpolation issues, but I need to keep a little box. You see the box? Okay. I feel like I think a little bit about that. Um, <laughs> but eventually, slowly, I ended up with a full alphabet in both ways. So, so um, welcome to the world of now. Um, uh, this is an interpolation, but the two masters were an extra bold and hairline. And like them, I'm also working lace later shapes as well, so I definitely prefer this one. Um, and the interpolated regular. And what I realized making these is that the Extra bold forced me to solve for a lot of negative space issues and hairline, a lot of space issues. So I think I may have ended up with a more stable regular than if I were to just to draw directly, but I'm not sure because I didn't do it, but that's my theory. Um, some key characteristics are the pointed serifs um, and then slow curve into them. And same idea in the terminals, but with a slight cut off at the end. Um, or I drew those the wrong way, I think. But, oh, quite a vertical stress and narrow proportions. Um, and then bringing in the most artistic flare and key glyphs. This is my favorite part. Okay. And then I also really like emphasize because it's not a lot of rules. You kind of do whatever you want. So I mean, for me, so it's like regular, and then maybe the night can go on, day can go on. Or workshopping names. Text, although I don't think it would really be useful for this session. And the whole interpolation. I'm just curious every other for a better one. This is a session. I think. 
Center of Assessment in the back. It's this one poem that you should read the whole poem of because I literally slashed it together. Maybe it's Alex. Um, this is where I really start having fun. I've been having fun the whole time, but um, with these days, I found out at Edgar that there's not a lot of rules to the palette either. You can like slant them this way or this way or make them narrower or make them lighter, just like as long as they're different enough. From your Rogan, so I just started like drawing a bunch of fun shapes and I went to a puzzle like that one because like, you can tell you're having fun. Yes. That communicates that I'm doing what I'm trying to do. But I was having too much fun because I prepared it after drawing a bunch of books to my Rowan or to just my hairline and it was like way thinner. Somehow I had gotten even thinner than my hairline, so I had to correct for that. Um, and I wanted for this month of books that I would like to complete it. Um, but what I did learn from the limited books I do have is that I was starting to create different types of shapes, actually this the A on that side is Moon's idea, and I am obsessed with it. I love it so much. And so I created that G also. And I want to like experiment more with shapes like that. John Quinn's also they were trendy, but I really like them. And if I create alternates, then you know you have a trendy option. I have a less trendy option. Um, and then he just in that I also did more open. Um, alts in the Roman, and I also I want to play more with those, some more closed versus open shapes in the Roman as well. Ligature is super fun, didn't make as many as him, but I would like to, and I want to do even more. And my favorite is the Empire Ligature, the, the blood droplet. These are also my so you can see the word today go up. Um, more alts. I just want to keep making all of And some applications. The brain designer in me. <laughs> Thank you. And also, before you clap, before you clap, <laughs> I just wanted to thank you so much to all the instructors. It's been such an honor to learn from such a talented group of people. I've learned so, so much. And all my classmates, I'm so inspired by you guys every day. So thank you so much for being here for this. It was amazing. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Sarah, and this is Gardner by Hercules. Um, it's named Gardner because I've been feeling like tired of gardening the past few weeks. And the reason is um, my brief was basically based on um, Japanese rock gardens, which I've been knowing since far back. And uh, basically, it's a style of uh, Japanese gardens where there are no, not much actual plants, but uh, rocks and sands, and people will carefully make use of them to recreate natural landscapes. And it's often used as an aid for meditation and to remind people to uh, be quiet and calm, uh, give them calmness. And I kind of find it a bit relatable to plant design because these two things are both something that uh, is created by arranging elements carefully and somehow very subtly, but um, they do work and give different feelings to people. So I feel like it makes sense to choose this as my brief to um, for my first attempt for writing one. And these are what, uh, more than that is the uh, keywords that I try to figure out about the typeface. It should be calm, delicate, and fragile, and somehow imperfect because um, 
the rocks and sand are natural things and they are never really asserted as any products. And on the that side, <laughs> it's, uh, because I don't really have an actual audience or user for web cafes but generally it would be for cafes, exhibitions, spaces, or something that relates to communication. So at the start of my um, process, I was really, really confused because I didn't really have a reference and all I had was images of rocks and sands and even though the inspiration was from Japan and uh, I, I can look at the river, it wouldn't make sense to look at East Asian or Japanese slavery because my main focus was the visual form and shapes of the cabin. So I had a confusing time and I even tried using the practice typeface from the first week to make all the curves straight lines, trying to make them for their boss, but it didn't really work out and it's really like putting a filter onto my practice typeface and I, at some point I was really confused and I printed out a lot of rocks and then my table was literally like I was like okay and playing with the rocks and I couldn't find a way out. And then the, the change was when uh, instructors reminded me of the sand in the gardens. So basically what I did before was to imagine the rocks as the black space, the shapes of my uh, typeface. But actually I can think of it the other way around. The, Instead of being the white space, the sand can be the black space. So basically, I, what I didn't mention is that in the Japanese rock gardens, um, people would make patterns on the sand with a tool like this, and they would slowly move and make patterns that resemble waves or rippling water. So basically, this was me at the beginning, and I was playing with calligraphy and then turning my head and some of the shape looks really weird and because uh, I couldn't like really control the form because I'm turning the pen all the time but I found this shape which is my hero shape I say it and uh, yeah when I see it I am like this is it I'm gonna follow this shape again. I thought everything will go smoothly, but then, because uh, after finding the hero shape, I was really uh, thinking about how I could keep the flow of the calligraphy in my face. So I was uh, basically really interested in just putting an insert on one side, but that actually didn't work out. And uh, I would say, um, I'm really indecisive about the surge and at some point I was trying to surge that's really round and they were like books. So uh, yeah, but Joshua told me that your surge looks okay and then okay, I'll go go for it. So and now I look back, I realize that uh, I feel like that surge looked like roots and it looked weird because I was looking at, at a very large size, but when you Look at it in a lot of assets and in a very small size that we will usually use in my face. Um, they are not really that new at all. And then another difficulty was uh, the shift in contrast. So basically, my concept was turning the pen in my favorite thing. So uh, my contrast is not a normal humanistic type based contrast. And I was really confused again because of that. I was really trying to recreate <coughs> uh, the calligraphy and I kind of got too fixated on that but soon I, I, realized, I realized I need to balance or else it would be it would give me a really hard time when I create other lessons. So at last I 
made a product out of bonds. So um, putting the focus only on the hero shape inserted and the other parts would look more like a normal uh, contrast. And more refining because uh, of the shifting contrast. And then uh, I also discovered some of these uh, signature features of my face, which is a combination between uh, round and pointy, and putting it all together. Is, well, my, my point was to <coughs> remind people of the gesture, so I really want to uh, keep the trace of the pen as well as both round and pointy because I'm turning it. Uh, this is my regular. Uh, and we started expanding the family, and I did a lot of other stuff, but I think my sensor is the most important mention because I really, it's the part that I enjoy most. So, um, yeah, I was really, I really liked how the pointy, the, the balance pointy and roundness, so I was. Basically, using that in all, almost all the kinds of my shorts. So, I really like how it rolls out in this, this it almost feels like it's very light and fragile, and it really works with my uh, rock island weave, where the sand the shapes, the pattern of the sand is full change music, and it's very fragile. I like uh, how poetic it could, could be. And also, the process of science, these are the situations where I think all the ends round or just straight, and I feel like the E was like a sensor, uh, I mean, a comic sense, which I totally like. Yeah. So, yeah, I really like how it comes in the market. And this is all I have right now, but um, they definitely need more development and tweaking. This is the a um, whole family. So basically, this is my main weight, my sand, and I made the italic as well to like uh, make more variations. And I made another master that's black, and the medium and gold are interpolated. And some more uh, letters. And the text, and seeing how the text flows and how the different weights go together. And this is a little mock up and see if it will work in this way. And that's it. Thank you and thank you. For so I'm the first to give the diploma shoutouts. Please come. Congratulations, Charlotte. So now we have Jess. We made it. There's no specific order, it's just random, uh, just, just to read. Mario Mario Baraga.
next one is for Tiffany. And now we have Emma. Last but not least, 